Living a life in full is a conversation you always wanted to have with that person who gave an amazing TED Talk, or the author of one of your favorite books, or that inspirational Olympian you always wanted to know more about. It's graduate-level conversations with those making a difference in the world and in the lives of others. This show brings you new ideas and approaches so that you can live a life in full. I'm your host, Dr. Chris Stout, and I hope you enjoy this episode. This episode is brought to you by the new fellowship and certificate programs now being offered by the Center for Global Initiatives. As you may know, the Center is an all-volunteer organization, and the same is true for the faculty in these programs, so all the tuition goes to support the work of the Center. It has always been our ethos to open-source humanitarian intervention, and these programs use the same approach in that all the materials we use are freely available all the time to anyone, everywhere, even if you don't take a course. We have built a world-class faculty in contracts with other universities, medical schools, and partnered NGOs. There are two fellowship tracks, one for those wishing to start their own nonprofit or non-governmental organization, and one for those seeking mentorship for career development and advancement in humanitarian work. Our initial certificate programs include humanitarian intervention, social entrepreneurship, and global health practice please consider taking a world-class masterclass with us. Visit alifeinfull.org and click on the Courseworks tab to learn more. Thanks. Welcome to another episode of Living a Life in Full. I'm your host, Dr. Chris Stout. Norma Kamali is one of America's most original and unique award-winning fashion designers. Known for her innovative and influential garments, which have set the standard for all of the biggest names in high fashion. She's won numerous, numerous awards and patents for her designs, including a Cody Award, the fashion equivalent to winning an Oscar, a plaque on the Fashion Walk of Fame, a CFDA Board of Directors Special Tribute Award, their Jeffrey Bean Lifetime Achievement Award, and the Firestarter Award from Forbes in Advocacy for Women's Empowerment. She's also a presidential award recipient for her work and leadership in the industry, as well as receiving the National Arts Club Medal of Honor. Norma was given the Women's Entrepreneurship Day Pioneer Award at the United Nations and received an honorary doctorate from her alma mater, the Fashion Institute of Technology. Her work is part of the Smithsonian and the Museum of Arts collections and has been in numerous other museum displays, showcasing her designs and celebrating her career. Additionally, she is a writer and director. Norma created and hosts the series Seriously on Women on Sirius XM, as well as hosting the Norma Life podcast, and she launched the Hey Baby campaign to stop the objectification of women. She's a leader in what she calls the democratization of fashion through affordability and sustainability. She's a pioneer in the application of innovative technology approaches in her entrepreneurial ventures as well. Her life and work have been punctuated with an involvement with a who's who of notables, including Lady Gaga, Beyonce, Michelle Obama, Twyla Thorpe, Raquel Welch, Jacqueline Bissett, Cher, Robert De Niro, Diana Ross, John Lennon, Bette Midler, Christy Brinkley, Madonna, Richard Avedon, and the list honestly goes on. Most recently, and part, a key part of our conversation in this episode, we'll focus on her latest book, I Am Invincible which is part autobiography and part guidebook on embracing a healthy lifestyle and looking forward to every milestone and changes they bring. I have been so looking forward to this conversation. Welcome to the show, Norma. Thank you very much, Chris. I'm so glad Jamie Metzl uh, reached out and connected us. I've really been a fan of your work for years. Oh, thank you. So perhaps we could start uh, with looking at how your career uh, got off the ground and some of the challenges that you've had to overcome in getting to where you are today. Well, you know, it's very interesting. Um, when, when we start our careers, we're usually um, not as experienced as we should be. And we think we know-ish what we want to do. And then the universe takes us on a little ride and we end up where we should be. Um, and so I wanted to be a painter. I 
Michelangelo was my god. I studied anatomy and life drawing for years because I wanted to be like Michelangelo. And my mother said, I think it would be good if you could start paying the rent or helping me. Um, so you might want to think of something a little bit more realistic. Um, fortunately, I had grants and scholarships, and one of them was to FIT. Um, I studied fashion illustration. I had an incredible um, instructor who was a wonderful Japanese woman who was very disciplined, very tough. She never would have made it through this more sort of lenient time. Um, but I, I am so grateful that she uh, gave me the desire to be excellent. She pushed for that, and I realized how important it was. I ended up having um, a job interview. That experience. I worked so hard on my portfolio, and... Um, when I finally arrived in the office, the gentleman who was interviewing me was having a tuna sandwich and he had his feet up on his desk and he asked me to come to where he was sitting and turn around for him. Oh boy. And that was, that was so, um, unbelievably devastating, even though it's hardly anything that you can't survive. But what it did was it, it had me leave the office in tears and deciding I never want to work in the fashion industry again. Wow. I want to travel and see the world. And I did. Um, I got a job in the office at Northwest Orient Airlines and we would fly to Milwaukee, by the way. Um, <laughs> and um, and I, um, I, I really learned a lot. I learned a lot about business and sales and promotions and marketing. I learned how to operate a Univac computer, which was one of the um, early placements of technology were at airlines. And I traveled to London round trip for four years every weekend for $29 round trip. Wow. And I got to see London explode into the revolution. I saw it from the very, very, very beginning. So I always look back at the people or the situations that were so painful that forced you to go in the direction you should be going in. So that man and his sandwich that I can act every time I think of it, I can smell the tuna sandwich. <laughs> I look at him and I thank him for pushing me out the door. Imagine if I would have gotten that job and sat in that place and worked for him. What would what would have happened? Maybe not have been the dream. I been dreaming about. And so I thank him for really being the catalyst to get me at the right place at the right time. And that's where my inspiration to be in fashion came about because the 60s revolution fashion was quite different from Mad Men fashion that had been just prior to that. And you, you were somewhat of a uh, an envoy or an emissary of what you were seeing in London, and uh, vis-a-vis the fashion. And then you came back to New York and sort of had like a a bit of an underground, um, you know, fashion shop or uh, boutique. Would you call it? And yeah. Tell us about that. So um, again, this is you know this is the '60s, so it's still kind of early. Um, and nobody had worn a mini skirt before that. Nobody. I mean, in the history of fashion, in streetwear, this just did not exist. And I was coming back with these skirts mid thigh, and cars were literally screeching, <laughs> and people were wow. calling out names and like what. 
And I just was very proud of my little mini skirts. And so were my friends who were screaming, you have to bring back more, you have to bring back clothes for us. And I did. And I found a little basement store for $285 a month. And I decorated it with Salvation Army things. And I even found snakeskin wallpaper at the Salvation Army, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, and that was my little shop. And, that, and I started um, selling the clothes while I was still at the airlines. And wow. I was married at, at 19, of course, brilliant decision. Um, and my husband at the time was studying economics and he, he um, sold the clothes during the day. And then I, I worked in early shift. So I worked from six to two. So I was able to can come back and uh, help out until I started to make clothes myself. Wow. So, and that was, um, your relationship with him lasted for about, uh, 10 years and then yes. you went on your way. Um, tell us about what that, uh, being back solo again was like for you. Well, you know, I, the two of us, um, were very young and very, um, inexperienced which is what happens when you're in your 20s mm -hmm. you kind of fake it and you you know you figure out what you're good at and you know what you're not good at and so we we just were growing in very different directions and um and it and, and i think it just uh went off in in just the path again where the sales girl that he was dating and that I kept firing and he would keep rehiring <laughs> oh, decided decided that she was going to design from now on and that she wanted me to make her designs. And I remember looking at her thinking, really? <laughs> really? Um, wow. And when she, when she left the sample room, the ceiling literally over my cutting table fell there must have been a leak in the in the between the floors and it just fell and i looked at the ceiling on my cutting table i packed up my bag and i just left and i i did not know what i was going to do i had 98 dollars because he controlled the money which uh, is typical at yeah, the time yeah. men took care of the money because men are much better at finance than women, supposedly. <laughs> and, um, right. <laughs> and I believed it quite frankly, cause I didn't know how I was at finance. And, um, and all I know is, and we had been separated for, um, a, almost a year at that point. And I had an apartment, but I had a mattress. I didn't have curtains. I didn't have furniture. I had my clothes and my dog. And, um, and it was really so frightening. But again, I, if I thank her, I thank her for kicking me out, pushing me out the door. And I had no idea that I had an, any ability with finances. I didn't ever tell anybody what was going on in my marriage. I kept it very private. And I had a, a pre-planned lunch with uh, an editor from the LA Times that I never, never met with anybody. I mean, ever. And she persisted. And the, the lunch was the day after I left. And I didn't know how to get in touch with her, so I met her at the restaurant, and my face was swollen from crying, and oh. she looked at me like, what happened to you? And it just poured out of me everything that I'd been holding in for many years, and um, she said, well, I'm going to help you. We're going to get you some sewing machines, and we'll get some help. Wow. And I learned at that moment that if you do not communicate what you need and if you do not tell your story, nobody can help you. You can't get advice. You can't get direction. You can't get support. 
And I learned that that keeping these secrets was just sort of a, 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 a path to nowhere. And communication was definitely a very important part of my growth from that point out. Well, you certainly have um, a variety of, of uh, stories and experiences that you share in your book, and maybe this is a good segue into it. So um, as mentioned in the intro, your new book is called I Am Invincible. Um, the Wall Street Journal recently did an article about you and your writing where they noted, quote, it is a very American mix of memoir and manifesto filled with personal stories, practical advice, and pronouncements in bold type, including don't eat sugar ever and stay inspired. Um, and I have to say, I really enjoyed it. Um, I love your format with like the green edges of Norma's guide. I mean, it made it very, you know, kind of easy to, to oh, deal thanks. with that. Sure. And the, and, and within that, for people that haven't uh, yet picked up a copy, um, you cover such, you know, such a vast landscape style and sleep and fitness and work life. And, and it's all while different aspects, it's all part of all of our lives. And I think you did it in such a, uh, complete but yet elegantly communicated kind of way and I, I geek out I have a lot of authors on the show and I always geek out about formats and things and I also like your black bordered pages because then it's sort of like I know I'm making this transition into mm. what I felt was a very frank autobiographical sharing of your personal experiences I mean you on aging and your lessons learned and and I really have to say your your uh, life timeline was amazing I don't know how many times uh, again, kind of nerding out on on uh, working with authors, but uh, I just love that because it really set. I could go back and forth in the book, in whatever chapter or section I was in, and kind of you know pinpoint this is what was going on. It was just, and plus your life timeline is pretty amazing, uh, as it is anyway. So. Um, if we could, could we step through the book using your decades model? Um, but but before we do that, uh, let's maybe set a context also. What Tell us about uh, the three pillars uh, as you've defined it as a healthy lifestyle. Could you discuss them and uh, talk about how you came to adopt them? Mm. Well, um, thank you very much. I you, you have no idea how much I appreciate your real detailed understanding of the book. I literally laid out every page myself. I, wow. I was that, yeah, I, am, I totally loved it. So you made my heart feel really oh, good. I it's, appreciate it. It is, it is beautiful. I, I, I mean, do. not, not I, just the words. I mean, your fonts, your image. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's, uh, thank pe people you. have thank to, you. have to get it. So I, um, in, in, in the eighties when AIDS was just devastating um, my friends, my industry, um, my two best friends, we all share very close birthdays. One was born June 26th, I'm June 27th, and my other friend was June 28th, and we were stuck together, like we did oh. everything together. And when they both died, oh. I fell apart. I felt like I didn't know how to deal with something that didn't have a, a solution that meant death, that meant it would end. And all I remember is hearing um, Dr. Fauci, by the way, huh. talk about um, AIDS and the progress and lack of progress that was being made. And it meant that the immune system was compromised. So you may have AIDS, but you could die of liver disease or heart disease or, you know, a anything but what you would think AIDS would do. And so I decided my way of dealing with grief would be to find ways that I could understand how to support and fortify the immune system. And so I this meant going to actual libraries with actual books <laughs> and, and actual, you know, research. And I, and I did a lot of research and I went out West and I went uh, and I met amazing people who were very underground in, in the concept of proactive health, healthy lifestyle. And um, actually Andrew Weil was 
very, very uh, much in the forefront of this at the time. And he would have these uh, weekend seminars and retreats, and he would invite people like Michael Pollan, who would just mm. started writing, um, talking and writing about food and how we grow food. And Dr. Lodog, uh, a Native American medicine woman who used herbs for health and curing, and he would talk about mushrooms and all kinds of things, um, acupuncture, Chinese medicine, and I was fixated. And he would have, do these seminars also for doctors to um, study these courses. And of course, they all were very, you know, well versed in chemistry, and I was not, but I would take my notes. I still have all my little books and notes. Uh, and I learned so much and I was so inspired and I met more and more mentors along the way. And I'm still friends with uh, Andrew Weil and with the a lot of the people that I've met at that time and more. And Horst from Aveda became an, an incredible mentor for me as well um, and learning about beauty products and how they were making women sick and how I could learn and understand and discover right away. As he said, you have to get rid of that red lipstick and those red nail polish. It's killing you. And he said, read this. And he gave me a study and that was the end of my signature red lips and red nails. That's <laughs> gone. I haven't had nail polish on ever since. Wow. And no no lipstick. So I really, um, I've been very, very fortunate to meet some fascinating people. And I learned about the three pillars of a healthy lifestyle, which are sleep, diet and exercise. And I made, I, I immediately made the practice of healthy lifestyle in mind. Prior to that, I think um, I probably smoked for a couple of years. I would eat bacon cheeseburgers um, <laughs> with, uh, you know, w w holding it in my with my red nails and then puffing on a cigarette <laughs> at the Perfect. same time. And, you know, real, a real pretty picture. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I really didn't think about any of it until I really discovered again how painful experiences or shocking or very disruptive experiences push you where you should go. And here again, um, I found this incredible adventure that is still a very big part of my life. So I incorporated sleep, diet, exercise and everything I've learned. Um, I wish I had more pages because there's so much more, but the, the essence is there on how important it is to use these three pillars um, as the most important tool to age with power. And I, I believe, and, I, and anybody who reads the book right after you close the book or after you hear a conversation that inspires the, the practice of following a healthy lifestyle, can incorporate this immediately without any financial investment. Mm -hmm. It's uh, very easy to, to just eat less food and better food. It's very easy to walk uh, or to go up and down a flight of stairs a number of times and get exercise or do anything that's movement. And sleep is something that is important to do every day because the stress we are experiencing now, especially, really takes a toll. And every cell in our body needs to get invigorated and restored for the next day. So you can't make up sleep on a Saturday for sleep you lost on Tuesday and Wednesday. So... I put a lot of information in the book on how to try to get into these practices without it being an awesome task that you can't, you have to think about and decide, this is just do it, just do it and 
keep doing it and um, it, it will be part of your lifestyle. So I really think making it free and easy is a great inspiration. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, one of the other things that you did in the book was to give a, a very nicely detailed um, set of resources at the tail end. So for some folks that might need a little bit more help or a little bit more coaching in an area that maybe they don't have, you know, much knowledge or experience with that it's a resource for them as well. But it is nice with the way that you put it together that it's not an overwhelming or, you know, it's not like reading the encyclopedia. I mean, you, you make the points, you give them very clearly. They're very, you know, um, um, almost little manifestos, you know, on certain pages, which is really, I think, engaging and, and very nice to see. And, you know, and you are, uh, I think, the the um, inspirational walking the talk as well, too. I think, you know, overall, COVID might put a speed bump in this in terms of longevity, but I think more and more people are also looking to not just having, you know, living a, a long life, but also continuing to live a full life in whatever things those might be, be it, you know, social and relationships, might it, it might be their work, it might be, you know, whatever aspects that, uh, you know, maybe um, our grandparents or great grandparents, you know, might have lived to a ripe old age, but really weren't that functional or very sedentary. And that's certainly not not something that um, that I think that we're seeing these days, and I think it really speaks to that need. So, so thank you for that. So, so to circle back to your um, origin story and and kind of stepping us through some of the things that uh, you've had to do. So, the twenties was you know what you talked about with London and your your initial start in in New York, and then this transition to a different circumstance. I I believe also in the book you talk about. Um, you were profiled in Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. People were starting to have some external appreciation and and seeing your work. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, I it, it's very interesting, especially at that age, when you're sort of working in the unknown. You have no experience, but you believe you're this. You know better than anybody. Um, I was so smart and so. You know, I I could hardly be half as smart as I was then. Now that I know better, <laughs> um, but but that was sort of the sort of the the ignorance is bliss philosophy, and so I just went went on my way to try to get it done. And in your twenties, you don't really know what you can do until you start doing it right and mm -hmm. you recognize where where your strengths are so i i i find that um learning through your 20s is the is the key but it's also a time in your 20s where you're most vulnerable because you are so inexperienced and that's where some of the most painful experiences take place. There's always that power in the room. There's always that, you know, um, the insecurity that you have for not knowing, you know, mm -hmm. not knowing if you're doing it right or wrong. And then realizing that you've embarrassed yourself or even in relationships and friendships and, um, and with sex and everything that's you're doing it the first time as an adult. You're really seeing who you are through these experiences. And getting through that, I think, is is such a big initiation because and people ask me all the time, when you like to be in your 20s again? I'm like, hell no. <laughs> what the heck would I want to do that for? There is no way. And, and the 20s there, I speak with a lot of them, you know, I've been meeting and, and talking to a lot of people who are, you know, Gen Z slash millennial, two very different groups, but they really feel so robbed that this very critical time in their development just shut them down and kept them isolated. Mm -hmm. And, um, and they're really, uh, the anxiety level is so high and, and you can understand it because these are precious moments in their discovery of themselves and, and who they might be. Right. 
So you make it through the 20s, things start to kind of get going, but uh, in your book you talk about being somewhat shy and, and inhibited, and you started mm-hmm. to mimic outgoing role models as being right. an entrepreneur. And I, I love, you had a section in there where you talked about, um, which must have been you know kind of a, a, a boon to your feeling a little bit more confident that uh, certain pattern, pattern makers said that your outlandish ideas couldn't be done. So then you figured out how to engineer right. your clothes yourself. And, and I don't know if the, the icing on the cake was doing Studio 54's Grace Jones New Year's Eve costume, but <laughs> tell us about the 30s and getting to that point of maybe a little bit more confidence and being able to do things right. that others couldn't. Well, I, you know, now I have employees who are all twice my age and very experienced and um and i have to pretend to be their boss and just like those <laughs> the, those pictures in vogue and bizarre where i kept thinking they're gonna find me out no i don't know what i'm doing and i have these pages so that recognition and at the same time also having to be a boss um was very overwhelming in certain ways and also inspiring in others where, okay, I'm getting recognition. Okay, I have, I'm hiring people. There's something, so I'm feeling a certain energy about that. But then when they don't want to pay attention to you because they don't think, you know, you're too young for them to to listen to. And, and I thought, I always... I always believe that if somebody says it can't be done, I have to prove that it can be done. <laughs> so I I studied fashion illustration at FIT and I had no desire to learn how to sew or anything like that. And all of a sudden it was like, I better learn how to do this. And I've never taken a pattern making course, but I learned really fast. and. <laughs> To still today, my favorite, favorite thing out of everything I do is making patterns. And I, I have pattern makers, I have a staff, but I enjoy the process. It's so meditative because you can't think about anything else. <laughs> you have to focus on what you're doing. And I love making swimwear patterns, and I just made two very challenging swimwear patterns in this this last week uh-huh. and i did it on the first shot you make the pattern oh, wow. the sample maker sews it and it doesn't need any fit corrections and i was like yes <laughs> I'm, I, so if how lucky am i to um still be doing the same thing 53 years later and feeling like I'm still getting better. Um, And, and so by having that resistance, I was very motivated to control what I could design, which allowed me to be inventive, which allowed me not to rely on other people's experience, which could be limited in certain areas that I wanted to go into where they feared to tread. Mm -hmm. I like that. It seems like a a wonderful evolution from having felt like, you know, imposter syndrome to then really kind right. of finding your your footing and being able to do these things yeah. that, that maybe at some point in time people said couldn't be done. Well, yes, they can be done. And now you've got it to a, yeah. a level of flow where it's a meditative process. And, you mm-hmm. know, that's that's quite the blessing. I think that certainly spills, speaks to your uh, skills and abilities. So now let's shift into the 40s. Um, Sydney Kimmel, uh, Global Licensing. Um, You became an overnight sensation after 12 years of being a cult underground designer. Uh, You got into home furnishings. Tell us, tell us about that time. Well, this is, this is interesting because 40s, you know, for in general, I think by the time you get to your 40s, you know your brand, right? And it doesn't it doesn't even have to be a business brand. You, you could be doing anything, but you know your abilities. And, and it's a time to monetize them or to uh, bring them together with a, a sort of a recognition. And 
here I was, I finally earned my, my brand. I finally earned the, the recognition. Um, and I was just, uh, I had the right collection at the right time. And, um, it was very, um, revolutionary. We were coming out of studio 54 with sparkles and all of that stuff to uh -huh. gray sweats. And, um, and I really, um, learned so much about my abilities through my forties. I learned about, um, my business sense, I learned about having lots of licenses and working with a lot of people from around the world. Um, I learned about telling my story in a bigger way. Um, and I loved giving, serving women. My purpose in life is obviously to have a creative life, but I also know I am totally at service to women and I am totally in love with the fact that I am. I, I feel very, very um, honored to do that. And so here I recognize that I could actually make people feel good. Um, and whether it was through a piece of clothing or something for the home or for kids or all of these kind of shoes, sneakers, everything. I learned that I had the ability to do it on a, on a grand scale if I wanted to. And here it was. And then there was also a learning experience of a split from Jones apparel. Tell us what happened then. Right. Well, you know, I was, very naive about the business world of um, unions and uh, deals that are made. And obviously, Jones Apparel um, was a huge company. Sydney would tell me every time I would complain about something like, <laughs> Why are these Why are these clothes in these different places that they shouldn't be? In? And he'd say to me, "You're only a pimple on an elephant's ass." And I'm like, <laughs> "Oh my god!" Um, so, uh, wow. so the, his relationship with the 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 um, the New York unions versus the Philadelphia unions that he had to deal with all of that stuff. I had no idea what that was about. But I had a huge learning experience, which is another part of the 40s. So in your 40s, you also have these big, now you can handle big stuff, right? And mm -hmm. so you have these big experiences. And this, this whole encounter of a world I had no knowledge of and the power of, of this world was fascinating to me. It was devastating because I I was in fear of things I didn't know. But I I was fortunate because I had a very big business in um, in Europe and internationally, so I could be very independent of whatever he had um, had worked out. But I I really enjoyed the. Um, the, the process and I enjoyed the, um, the, the time I spent with Sydney and, uh, we, we were going to get together again to do another business, uh, deal. And we had some ideas through the years, but I, I have a whole other book on that period of time. It would, it's a whole other, it's a, it's a Netflix series. It's not even a book. Wow. <laughs> I believe it. That would be great. <laughs> well, the shift, and again, it seems like there's this this constant um, thread of you know learning from a variety of kinds of experiences. Not everything's going to be you know rainbows and butterflies. Right. There's these kinds of things right. that then you know create probably a bit more. Um, gumption on your part and a bit more, mm -hmm. you know, Hey, I can do this independently. There's not always, there's, there's times for support. There's times for help and assistance and right. there's times to, you know, say thank you and fare thee well. <laughs> so, 
So then was the 50s, your 50s kind of the, it was the wellness cafe beginning and, and was this more of the um, awakening and awareness around the um, lifestyle kinds of issues? Tell us about that. Well, um, 50 is huge for everybody. Um, and I, I can only say that 50, first of all, the, the, the evolution between the, the transition period in, in your 40s, the late 40s into 50 is like um, a snake shedding its skin. Mm-hmm. You really emerge uh, and, and it's a great time for reinvention. And I decided to get rid of all of my possessions and I had some serious possessions. I had an incredible home, uh, a a place that I looked at as a little girl. Every time I would go to the museum, I would wonder who lived in these buildings. They were so extraordinary. And I ended up feeling at one point when I was sketching my collection that the beauty around me was so extraordinary with things I collected and put together and made but it was trapping me in a way to stay in that and not move forward. And I decided that I wanted to move forward and I was gonna have to let that go. Mm -hmm. And so it was a big, big, big decision. And I literally, I had an auction at Christie's. I gave away a lot of things. I had so many things and I had uh, every sample collection I created from the beginning at a warehouse, um, sold all of that. Wow. And I decided from that point out that I wanted a minimal lifestyle so that I had a blank canvas at all times mm-hmm. for new ideas. And still today, I am Miss Minimal. Um, <laughs> Good it, for you. It does take some adjusting to strangers and new people in your life. I will say that. Yeah. <laughs> where are the photos? Where are the like? Where are the paintings? Where is everything? Um, but I. But that was a very big transformation. So in in my fifties. I was really down to the basics. I had been living this healthy lifestyle. And at this point, uh, and, and I was doing that through my 40s, obviously. But at this point, I decided to um, open the Wellness Cafe and really make a statement about it, really bring products together that could support the immune system and bring people together to have conversation out in the open. People would think I was a kook. Like they'd say, oh, you're so kooky, Norma. You talk (laughs) about these things like, okay. But then then I found people who thought the same and we would have speakers and events with uh, trying lots of different things. And, um, And that was my sort of presenting this as a part of what I wanted to offer um, as part of what I did. So that the transformation we make through 50 to 55 really sets the tone for the rest of your life. It really is you are making a decision either to be visible or invisible. And that's a big decision to make. And there is no reason to become invisible. There is no reason to age gracefully. There is lots of reason to age with power and to be visible and to be a contributor to your community or your world or whatever it is that you want to do to to engage and interact with people. I think you have so much so many examples that are very inspirational of how you've um, done that. And I think it, it really speaks to your authenticity as well, too. I mean, it's sort of like there's, I think a lot of times people will have these transitions of, you know, owning possessions and possessions owning them. 
and realizing that, you know, I, you know I've kind of gone through a similar, um, we were talking off mic beforehand about our move. And mm-hmm. it was, um, you know, my hardest thing was like, you know, books. I felt like I was saying goodbye to some friends who had been there for me, you know, during hard right. times. And, you know, I didn't right. give away every book, but, you know, there, there are certainly some that I, you know, will continue to keep and treasure. And there's almost this aspect of, you know, this, the, the totem of what you do keep because it's so, you know, there's some, you know, usually other kinds of meanings because it represents a time in your life or other kinds of things. So it really, you know, I, I, I very much get that. And I think it's a nice way that you then operationalized it, <clears throat> pardon me, also through the, the Wellness Cafe and being able to get that sense of community and approaches to be able to do those things. And I guess it, it probably teed you up then for... Um, you know, you've you've kind of coined this term the democratization or democracy of fashion, mm-hmm. um, and you have had you've done I think some very radical, cool things around sustainability. Uh, you've had some of your fashions available at Walmart, um, mm-hmm. and and some people I thought this is an interesting point. I think it was in the book about uh, people would buy them and then reprice them more expensively and sell them on eBay. <laughs> you know? Exactly. So, exactly. So um, tell us about this era, and and in particular maybe a, um, a touchstone with this. Tell us about what the significance of room 741 at Washington right. Irving High School is. I will. Um, I want to just hop back to your book story because I too, you know, treasured my books and, uh, and things like that. But, but what the interesting thing that I, that entered my head about possessions like that was that other people, like your, that book, um, unless there were references in, or in it or something you needed to, to look at again or you wanted to reread over a period of time, that book deserved to have another, another family or another person to have that experience hmm. or whether it's a piece of clothing or I had so many tapes, music tapes and things that I just thought there's another life for this. There's instead of just sitting on a shelf or in a warehouse or if I'm not actually using it, somebody should be. It shouldn't it talk about sustainability, right? <laughs> it's Good a point. perfect example yeah. of let it be sustainable by holding on to it and not interacting with it, it's not, a, it's not good. It's not a sustainable concept. But if that, it's just like clothing where people buy something, they hand it down to somebody else, and then it goes into a vintage store, and then somebody else buys it, and it, it can keep having a life. And I, I'm a big believer in having that cycle going and I've learned to really um, keep that I transfer you know you talk about room 741 741 was my homeroom class at Washington Irving High School a public school in New York City referred to as survival of the fittest high school so I went there because I needed to get a scholarship I needed scholarships and grants to go to college because my mother definitely couldn't afford it as a single mom. And so I traveled to get to this school, a very tough school, so that um, they had a very good art course there, by the way, and I was able to get that. But room 741 was so meaningful for me that when I was asked to come back when the school, the school was, was all girls, and then when it became co-ed in the 80s, they were having a really hard time. It was survival of the fittest before then, and it was like, I don't know, hell wow. on wheels after. Gosh. So they, they contacted me and some other graduates to say, we need help. The neighborhood um, stores are going out of business. People are complaining that their cars are being destroyed and that the kids are just running rampant. And we need to engage them. We need you to come help. 
And I realized they were thinking that I should, you know, have some fundraising. And I was like, I'm not, that's not what I do. I'm happy to go in the classroom. Let me in the classroom. I can, I, I'm, I can do that. I'm a city girl. I'm not afraid. They said, no, no, no. You can't. I was like, just get me in the classroom. And so I remember going into the classroom and absolutely not one person in that room would pay attention to me. <laughs> oh, gosh. And so finally, one girl raises her hand, but does it, her back is to me. She's just raising her hand. She was busy putting on makeup. And, <laughs> oh, she, <great. laughs> um, and she said, so, what's it, so miss, what's in it for you to be here? Because they've been let down so many times. That yeah. was an obvious question. Mm. And I said, well, I sat in this very classroom, and because I sat in this classroom, I w learned and was inspired to do what I'm doing today. And I explained to them what I'm doing, and I explained what I was, you know, what, what that meant, and that I could hire people, and that I had power as a woman in an industry, and... And I started to get their attention. And, um, and so it evolved beautifully. And I, um, I transformed that room into a design studio. I put in cutting tables and sewing machines and mannequins. And we, we took it from there. And um, it was a, a, a wonderful, wonderful experience for many, many years. Uh, I'm, I am a, a big advocate of education for all children, um, no matter what the income is. And I learned a lot about the public schools, and that's another Netflix series we can <laughs> okay. deal with. I'm telling you, that's a big one. I'm making notes. Uh, <laughs> and I was very, very, very involved uh, on a daily, on a daily basis with the parents, the teachers, the kids, and um, and and I and I really. Um, I plan to go back to 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 that after we have our next mayoral election because I am so I I feel so committed and thankful for my education and um, and this city that I really feel very very uh, inclined to engage again. That's great. Again, it just it, these experiences are so I think. Um, emblematic of who you are. There's so many people that would prefer to write the check, prefer to do the glamorous fundraiser versus, you know, rolling up the sleeves, getting in the equipment, spending the time with the kids and actually, you know, going in and doing that. That's, mm. I, I tip my hat to you. So that brings us up to uh, now you've been called a wellness goddess, <laughs> which I, I particularly like that. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, you are working with uh, the American Ballet Theater with dance costumes and, and Twyla Thorpe. Um, you have also, again, been kind of, uh, I think, a, a leader in the area of male and female fluidity. Um, mm -hmm. I, I remember I actually had a guest a couple of um, episodes ago on. We got to talking about the New York Dolls, and right. I know that you've been involved, were involved with them back in the day, and and really kind of have this, um, I think, very clever, creative, non-binary kind of perspective. And mm -hmm. you've relabeled sizing based on body type. How how did you come up with that? And for people that aren't familiar with that, uh, explain what that is. Well, I, I think it's really um, important to put a little history to this. So in the 70s, um, there, there was a period, I've always made women's clothing, right? I never, uh, I just made clothing that I liked and my customers were women. However, in the 70s, there was a period where we started to look at the sales receipts and we realized that 50% of our clients were men and 50 were women. It was a half and half wow. and, and it was that way for a while. And, uh, and it was fantastic because 
this was a time where free expression was very, very much the way people dressed. And um, if you think about Mick Jagger on stage, you're probably too young to remember this, yeah. but I, I do. Um, on stage with lipstick and a uh, woman's shirt and nail polish and just swishing around on stage and, and appealing to everyone, men, women, by whatever your thing is, you can be attracted to Mick Jagger. And he really, and, and many others, he wasn't the only one, but he's a good example of it, um, were totally free of the the identification of gender that really, I mean, if you think about it in, in, a, in a lot of people's lives, it's put a big burden on what a man should have to do and what a woman has to do. And like, what, isn't it more important what a person should do? And, and so, um, and we all, you know, I like, I like dressing masculine and feminine, and and I believe men do too. And, and I find that very appealing. And a lot of women find it very appealing when a man has a feminine something that they like. It just shows a gentle side that is extremely sexy and appealing. Mm -hmm. And so then came AIDS and it shut that down completely because people were so afraid of the unknown and what was going on. And so every guy was dressing as butch and looking, you know, almost shaved hair, like they just got out of the army and walked out too much and had plaid <laughs> shirts and boots and jeans and like, oh, oh, the feminine aspect, just you couldn't find it anywhere. And so what, what's happened over time is people who really remember AIDS, who remember and had the experience I had and the experience people of my generation have had, are far, far removed now from the, the, the population. And I started to see um, an interest um, from people on a photo shoot. I, I remember the first conversation that sort of activated this was I was having a photo shoot and the assistant hair, hair designer, hair dresser um, was a big New York Dolls fan, like an, an, an extraordinary New York Dolls uh -huh. fan. And he looked like he could be a New York Doll. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and he said to me, I love these clothes. I wish I could wear them. I'm, you know, I'm a big Dolls fan and I know what they wore of yours and he knew everything. Uh, and I said, well, when the photo shoot is over, why don't you pick out some, some things you like and we'll take some pictures, just put some outfits together. And he did. And from that point on, I have done that each season with either people I think might be good candidates for it, for a photo shoot, guys that work for me or models. And it is the most exhilarating thing to see. They have no memory of AIDS personally. So mm. this free thinking about gender fluidity is really a natural thing. I think it's a thing that, um, men would admit to that they do like some feminine things and they do like creams and they do like to do some of these things that we love and why not? And so the gender fluid um, concept, I believe, is going to go on because God bless Gen Z. <laughs> they are amazing. I love them. <laughs> they have no walls up. They have no barriers up. They're not talking about what divides us. They are only talking about all the things that connect us. So there are no harsh lines for religion, race, 
gender, any of that. It's just one big fluid friendly thing and they are very spirited and they're very they're very community minded and I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how this rolls out. It's nice to see that I agree. It's nice to see that in the context too then of also taking care of oneself and fashion and clothes because I think sometimes people <laughs> sort of silo those things into different areas and see them as not, you know, being interconnected and I think you do a wonderful job of bringing them very synthetically all together. Um, I, I, if you have the time, I just have a few more questions, but there's an area, great. I, there's an area I want to talk to you about and that's your activism and humanitarian work. Um, it's also been very broad spectrum. Um, and it includes your battling of the objectification of women, of living on purpose and embrace and embracing proactive, well living and well being. And you, you're also quoted, I forget if it's in the book or just elsewhere, it's probably in a variety of places, noting that girls compete and women empower. Uh, tell us more about that and uh, your work in this area. Well, the, um, objectification um, really um, is an experience that women my age and younger um, experienced constantly through um through every aspect of our lives and while it was the norm and we accepted it as as the way it should be it would not i i would say it would be uncomfortable and embarrassing and humiliating at many times and those those experiences really have an imprint on um, self-esteem and um, and how how we function as women. And so, after years of this, there's a lot of anger and a lot of pain. And unless we talk about it and recognize it, nothing would happen. And this was a big period of time prior to Me Too that I started to create conversation about it so that we could talk about some of these painful experiences. And to be honest, my experience in my first job interview, I did not talk about when I came home, I, I told my mother I didn't get the job and I didn't talk about it until I, I literally pushed it out of my mind until I started to open conversation with women that I'm around all the time about our secrets, talking about our secrets that we never told anybody. And then I realized I had all these secrets, all of these, these situations that were painful for me that I needed to just get rid of and I needed to get rid of them by sharing them and by sharing them I would be inspiring other women to remember their experiences and it's sort of like the big cleanse that mm. we would have and some of these stories were very very painful and very difficult um, and the the realization for fathers that this is what girls go through was the big motivation so that if a father heard these stories from his daughter and his wife, he would then be an advocate for um, ending the objectification of women. And we were really making very good headway and that conversation was very important. And it still is important, but there's so much more support for women and more education. Um, and so the idea of empowering women and, and having these dreams that could be real, these big dreams that women never thought of. We thought of little practical dreams, but big dreams always were sort of a male thing. And the, the idea of mentoring girls and all of those those pages that I've written in the book about supporting young women um, and giving giving women a platform was really uh, a very important part of the evolution 
of this um, awareness about the objectification of women. That's great. So um, what's next for you? Well, so I'm a long game person, right? Mm -hmm. I, um, I decided that when I interviewed, um, by the way, you, you referred to some of the um, products in, that I list in the in the book, because so many people have been asking about more things. I'm I'm putting up some things um, on my website, and I've also have uh, podcasts of people that I've interviewed who are experts in hormone um, therapy and experts in aging and scientists who know a lot about it. So I do have more information to follow. But one of the, um, one of the things that um, I'm thinking about is expanding uh, the book further in that way and also with more education and bringing people together Great. to what people virtually can learn from. Um, but I also um, look at 120 as the last, the last turnover of the cells I learned from one of these scientists. Uh -huh. And I thought, well, you know, I don't know what my genetic makeup is. I really don't. And Whatever it is, I'm going to ignore it, and I'm going to say, I want to live to 120. Therefore, I have to be mindful of what I do each day and how, what, how am I taking care of myself and make my plans accordingly. So think ahead. The long game is there for me. So I'm in the immediate future, I'm launching... Um, some soft furniture ideas during a disruptive time like COVID, like a pandemic, the door is open for innovation. And I love disruptive times because I do better with innovation. I'm more of an inventive designer. Um, so I, I find these times very inspiring and my staff want to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we're launching this soft furniture and, um, and I'm, uh, I have a new concept for, um, for movement, um, physical movement and that I'm also going to, uh, present probably in the middle to the end of the summer, just before the fall. And, um, and I'm working on um, lots of fun projects that have to do with um, new ideas in a new time and new communication. Gosh, I, I can't wait. Wow. <laughs> I can't either. Well, mm -hmm. good. And send me, as these things become available, and we'll make sure we get them into the show links uh, as well, too, the show notes. Oh, great. So, Norma, I just want to thank you again for all the things that you have done and that you are doing and now that we've learned are, are going to be doing to make the world such a, a better <laughs> place and more fun place and more engaged place. And thank you for sharing your wisdom. I, I think it's really a, a testament to your kindness and to your generosity. So for uh, listeners that would like to learn more about your work, more about what's coming down the pike, uh, what are the best ways? Well, um, normakamali.com, there's the normal life section. So there, there's in information about healthy lifestyle there. And, um, and the book is at Amazon. And I thank you so much for having such a thorough, well thought out plan for this meeting. <laughs> I really, really uh, appreciate oh, it. It's my it, pleasure. It's, it's fantastic. It's, I, I mercenarily get two bonuses. One is I get to enjoy the book. And then two is I get to talk to the author. So it's it's been a treat for me and our listeners as well. Thank you so much, yeah. Norma. And yeah, thank you. And thank Jamie. For That's right. Shout out to together. Jamie Metzel. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. All right. Take, Have a great day. You Take too. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Living a Life in Full is a production of Stout Media, a subsidiary of Gordian Knot, LLC. Assistant producer, Gracie Wong. Music, Dan O'Brien. Executive producer and host, Dr. Chris Stout. To learn more, stop by our website, A Life in Full, for show notes. And please recommend us to your friends and subscribe on your favorite platform. And as for the obligatory disclaimer, this podcast is for general information uses only. It does not constitute the practice of psychology, medicine, nutrition, or other professional health care services, including the giving of medical or psychological advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, I take conflicts of interest seriously. For all of my disclosures as well as show notes, please see livingalifeinfull.org slash podcast and my LinkedIn profile. Thanks, and until next time.